This is my pre-algebra course. This is the first class of the course, and it's the most important class, because today I'm going to give an introduction, and I'm going to talk about how to stay organized, and also we're going to talk about course content. Uh, first, let's talk about what pre-algebra is. Uh, pre-algebra is uh, designed to prepare you for algebra, but the name is kind of deceiving because pre-algebra suggests that this is a course uh, before algebra, but traditionally, pre-algebra courses are mostly algebra. So just be aware that most of this course is actually going to be algebra. Now, when you take pre-calculus, uh, th those courses are actually, uh, the, the names are, are, are more correct because those courses don't really contain any calculus. They're mostly just preparing you for calculus. But pre-algebra is mostly algebra. Here's pre-algebra in the math sequence. As you can see, it's the second course in the math sequence. There it is right there. Uh, so you should, uh, you should have arithmetic finished. Arithmetic is a prerequisite. So a prerequisite means something that's required before you do some sort of uh, uh, activity. So the activity is pre-algebra. Before you complete, uh, before you take pre-algebra, you need to take your prerequisite course, which is arithmetic. So uh, you can take my arithmetic course if you haven't already taken an arithmetic course. There's no textbook required for this course because I provide all the practice problems and all the homework and all the answers to the homework. The minimum pace is uh, two classes per week and two homework assignments per week. That's the absolute minimum pace for the course that you need to make uh, sufficient progress in this course. But I just want you to be aware that you can also, uh, you can go faster if you want. You can uh, complete three or four classes per week and, th and three or four homework assignments per week. Now, if you if you do two classes per week, it's gonna the course is gonna last about 14 weeks, and if you do the the quicker pace, seven seven to ten weeks. But I just want you to be aware that the limiting factor when it comes to speed is the homework assignments. You can watch the the videos, my classes, and just kind of zone out, but that doesn't really prove that you're learning anything. The homework actually proves that you're learning something. So the homework is really going to be the primary burden in this course, and that's going to determine how fast you can move. So just be aware that if you want to move faster in this course, you can, but uh, the homework is going to start to become uh, uh, laborious. So just be aware of that. Now, uh, this is the uh, math progressions that uh, exist out there. Uh, this is the traditional uh, math sequence. And in, in, nor in uh, traditional schools in the United States, it's going to take you about 14 years to finish the entire math sequence. That's the, uh, the sequence that I showed you here. It's going to take about 14 years. Now, I just want you to be aware that it doesn't really take 14 years to finish the math sequence. 95% of the time that you spend in school is doing work that doesn't really help you move through the math sequence or it doesn't even prepare you for college. So in my school, what I do is I, I replace all of that work that doesn't prepare you for college with work that does prepare you for college. And what that allows you to do is it, it, it uh, allows you to move much, much quicker. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going, you're going to finish in about three, three years for the math sequence. So you're going to finish about five times faster in my school. And that's what's going to be best for you. You know, that may not be best for other people, but we don't care about what's best for other people. This is your education. We're going to do what's best for you. And uh, in case you're, you're thinking that that's not possible to finish the math sequence five times faster, and by the way, that it doesn't mean that you're going to do more work. You're not going to do more work. You're just going to replace work that doesn't prepare you for college with work that does prepare you for college. It's very simple. You're just going to get a more productive education. So you're not doing more work, you're just doing uh, better work. Uh, but in case you don't believe that you can move that fast, uh, I just want you to see the progression through the community colleges in the United States. The community colleges, they teach most remedial math courses. And if you move at their pace, you're going to finish in five years. So that's still three times faster than the school system. So it is possible to move much, much quicker. The community colleges prove that. So I don't. I could launch into a, an eight-hour discussion about you know this stuff, but I want to keep. Uh, I want to. I want to go through uh, the most important things for this class. I don't want to. You know, I can cover this in, in another video. I just want to focus on what you need for pre-algebra right now. So I want you to be aware. I already touched on this, 
But I want you to be aware that the homework is 75% of the work in this course. It's the hardest thing that you're going to do in this course and in any math course. Watching the classes, that's only about 20%. And studying for the test and taking the test, we don't really like studying for tests and we don't like having to take tests, but that's not the majority of the work in this class. That's only about 5%. The homework is, is, is the big part. And so there's a lot of students out there that are going to say, you know what, I'd prefer not to do the homework because I don't really like homework and, and it seems like that's going to be the hardest part of the course. So I'll just, I, I would just like to, to, uh, to not have to do the homework. Well, I want you to understand very clearly that no one in the history of mankind has ever passed a math course without doing the required homework. It's not possible. I want you to understand that there are some courses where you know you can study for two or three hours uh, the night before the final exam and you can get an A in the course. That's not how math works. No one in the history of mankind has ever done that. It doesn't work. It will never work. And you're probably thinking, well, I can make it work. I can find a way. No, you will not. You will not find a way. I want you to understand very clearly uh, that there's no way to get around this. Uh, you must do the homework. You, you have to do uh, a homework assignment after every class. There's no other way to, to learn this material. Math is just not something that you can learn in a couple of hours or even in a couple of days. When you're studying for a math test, you need a minimum, a minimum of two days to study for that test. I'm not talking about two hours. I'm talking two days. Okay, so math, so, uh, uh, and, and that, that's, just, that's just the minimum. But uh, if you haven't done the homework assignments, then it doesn't matter if you study for a week. You're not going to pass the test. So with math, it, it's just it's, it's not something that you can study the, the, the night before. You have to do a homework assignment after every class or you will not make it through this course. It's impossible to, to, to make it through a course without doing a homework after every class. All right, so uh, I want you to be aware that uh, answers for all the homework problems will be provided. And I've had some students say, well, isn't that cheating for you to provide the answers? Well, no, because the work that you show will prove that you did the homework. Okay, if you just write the answer and say, I did it, that just proves that, you, in, in the mind of a teacher, that just proves that you cheated. You have to actually show the steps. The most important thing in this course and any math course is showing the steps that you took to get your answer. If you don't show those steps, all that proves is that you cheated. You may not have cheated. You may have done it in your head, but it doesn't really matter. You're going to, you know, you're going to get a zero if you don't show your work. Uh, so... Also, I want to mention that 95% uh, of my classes will be practice problems, half of which you're going to participate in. So the way that my classes are going to work is I'm just 95% um, of the time, it's just going to be me doing practice problems. I try really hard not to lecture because students don't want to hear lecturing. They don't care about, about uh, a teacher's lectures. They really don't. All they want to know is tell me what to do and I'll, and I'll do it. And that's it. That's the way it works with math. If you've worked with, if if you taught math for for a, a for a number of years, and you know that that's just the way it works. Do not lecture. Try try really hard not to lecture, or else your kids are just going to uh, fall asleep. And uh, so most of my courses are going to be doing practice problems. But even the five percent uh, that that I'm going to be lecturing, you might get tired of that. And so if you get tired of of hearing me lecture, just be be aware that the the only the, the the value of my 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 when when I'm talking when I'm when I'm saying something the value is really motivation I'm trying to motivate you to to move through the course but as long as you're motivated you don't need to listen to me talk at all you just need to do the practice problems in my classes and do the homework and that's it that's all that's required for this for this course so, uh, it, but if you do get tired of my lecturing, you can use the right and left arrow keys to jump five seconds forward or reverse on your keyboard, and and you can use the L and J keys to move ten seconds fo forward or reverse. Now, that's if you're using YouTube. I don't know if it's if it's different for something else. So, if you if you're tired of hearing me talk, just skip forward or skip skip uh, go in reverse, and uh, that's completely fine. As long as you do the, all those practice problems in my classes, and if you do the homework homework, that's all you need to uh, perform in this class. I also want to mention that the way that the classes are going to work is I'm going to do practice problems, and then I'm going to ask you to do practice problems. 50% of the practice problems we do in the class is going to be uh, you attempting the practice problems. So when I stop, when I say it's time for you to try a problem, do the problem. 
Don't just wait for me to do it. When I say pause the video and do the problem on your own, you must do the problem on your own. That's critical. Because if you don't attempt the problems on your own, you're not going to be prepared for the homework. Then, you, then when you do the homework, you're not going to be able to do it, and you're going to complain, you're going to blame everybody else and say, I can't do it, when it's really your fault. All right, so uh, now as far as the homework assignments go, how are you going to access the homework assignments? You can look at the homework assignments on your computer by just pressing pause on the video. Or you can take screenshots and print them out and put them in your three-ring binder. Um, on a PC, you can just hold the Windows button and press part screen. If this doesn't work, search online for the buttons to push for your computer. For an Apple computer, press Command Shift 3. It's different for every computer, so just go online and type in your computer model and type in how to take a screenshot, and that'll tell you how to do that. So as far as your homework goes, you're going to keep your completed homework assignments and tests in a three-ring binder on, or, or a digital device. All right, so that said, let's talk about how to stay organized in this course. The most important thing when it comes to any course is staying organized. Now, there's a lot of students out there that are going to say, I don't need you to tell me how to stay organized. You know, I've, I've got my own system. I don't care about your system. You're going to do it the way I tell you to do it. There's a particular way to stay organized, which is really, it's the best way to stay organized. And I want to make sure that you are using the best methods for organization from day one. And this is the method I want you to use not only in this class, but every class you take throughout your entire life. You're going to use this method, but especially, especially with, my, with my courses. So there's two ways to stay organized. Uh, one way is with, uh, you know, paper, pencil, and a binder, and the other way is with a digital notebook. So uh, if you use a, a three-ring binder, it's about $20 or $30 for all the supplies that you're going to need, where if you use a digital notebook, it might, it'll probably cost you a minimum of $800. So that's a big difference as far as price. When it comes to uh, uh, keeping a record of your work, the good thing about a three-ring binder is that you have a hard copy, whereas a digital notebook, it's all, it's all just data. So I just want you to understand that there are risks when it, when it comes to using both a hard copy or a, a, a data. You know, there's a, there's, there is a risk that if you put your, your binder in your closet and, you know, your house burns down or something, you could use your, the, the only record of your work. You lose the only record of your work. Um, so, but when it comes to a digital notebook, obviously your data can become corrupt and so on and so forth. So there's, there's, there's positives and negatives to using, uh, uh, you know, either, either uh, method of staying organized. But I just want you to be aware that uh, even though it's, it's probably a little scary to think about using a digital notebook because all your, all your notes are, are in our are, are data, you should be aware that uh, if you're using the cloud with Microsoft OneNote, for example, then you can keep multiple copies of your data. The cloud will keep a copy. If you have a smartphone, you can keep a copy. If you have a two-in-one laptop or any kind of PC, you can keep a copy there. And if you have, for example, like an iPad, you can keep your copy there. So if you have multiple copies, keeping your notes in the, in, uh, on, as data is not as scary as you might think. It might actually be safer. So again, there's no guarantee that you're not going to lose your work when it comes to either of these methods. But uh, th those are the two... two uh, differences. Now, I want you to understand that I, I like digital notebooks because they're easier to use. It's easier to, to do a lot of things. For example, if you're going to write an equation, um, x minus 3 equals 4, but you're running out of room and you want to move it, then with the OneNote program, you can just take the equation and move it around. So it's a lot easier to, to uh, deal with your notes, and it's a lot easier to stay organized. So this program that I'm using is OneNote, which is part of uh, Microsoft's Office package. There are four programs, uh, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, and OneNote. Most people know what a, um, a Word, uh, PowerPoint, and Excel are. They kind of have an idea of what those are, but I feel that a lot of people don't really even know what OneNote is. Well, it's basically just an, a note-taking program, and that's what I'm using now. You can see that you can do all kinds of things. You can you can have pictures. You can have, you can put documents on here. You can you can type. But uh, as you can see, it's very easy to stay organized. Look at this. These are all my all my pages. I've got my different courses, and I've got the uh, my my different notebooks. So you can see it, it's very easy to st stay organized. So that's one of the, the the positives of having a digital notebook. But I just want you to be aware that you don't have to spend eight hundred dollars for a digital notebook. So don't be if you're a parent thinking about this and, and, you, and you don't want to pay $800, you don't have to pay $800. I'm not trying to convince you that you have to do that. 
So anyway, let's talk about uh, your, th your three ring binder and so on and so forth. So this is a three ring binder down here. And I want you to get a, a at least a one inch three ring binder. And also when you buy a, a three ring binder, you need to get the, see how these rings are kind of diagonal? You must get diagonal rings because that, that makes, that protects your paper. The, the circular rings will, will, will damage your paper. Also the diagonal rings will, will allow for more paper. So they're just much, much better. Be sure that you get one of those. Let's go ahead and, and look at the, the type of, uh, the type of a binder. So this is the uh, the three ring binder. This is a one and a half, one half inch, but I want you to get a one inch binder. And you're going to keep your your homework for today, and your homework for the next class, and then the next class, and the next class. So the the early the the uh, the earliest homework is going to be at the beginning of your binder. Uh, that's how I want you to stay organized. Now, if you take a screenshot or if you print something out, I want you to use this three-hole punch to uh, punch three uh, holes in, in the paper. And this is how you use a three-hole punch if you haven't used one. So I'm going to require you to get that three-hole punch. And let's say that this is that you're a paper for your from your first class, then you would put it at the very beginning. You must stay organized this way for this class and every other class. If you don't stay organized, you might as well just drop out of school. Now, never, ever use this sleeve on a three-ring binder because it's not going to be in order. And if you uh, drop your, your binder, the, it's just going to fall out. So don't use those sleeves. Now, when you're not using your uh, three-ring three uh, hole punch... You can keep it in your binder. The point here is you're going to have everything in one binder because you're probably thinking, why are you making such a big deal about this? Well, you need to have everything in one binder. And be aware that if you get a one half inch binder uh, and you put your three hole punch in there, it's, it's, it's not going to close all the way. All right, so you need to get lined paper, college ruled. Uh, I want you to get paper mate yellow mechanical pencils. These are the paper mate mechanical pencils. Those are the best pencils to use. I want you to get uh, erasers. And the reason I want these uh, mechanical paper mate pencils is because you can put a replacement eraser at the top, and it doesn't it doesn't interfere with the function of the the pencil. And I don't I don't know why anybody uses regular pencils anymore. Uh, mechanical pencils are just much much better because you don't have to sharpen them. So don't use regular pencils. Uh, use mechanical pencils. Also, I mentioned a three-hole punch. This is what the three-hole punches cost, about $5.29. That, that's a picture from uh, 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 CVS. And also, you need to get reinforcement stickers just in case your, the, the holes rip. You can put these stickers, and that, re that reinforces the, uh, the papers. So the whole principle here is to keep everything in one place. You know, if you're a parent, you need to understand that your kid needs to keep everything in one place. And if you're the student, again, you need to understand that also. You need everything in one place. Do not buy uh, spiral notebooks. Do not buy these. Because if you have something that you need to print out, you can't really put it in this notebook. So do not use a spiral notebook. Again, you're probably thinking, well, I have a spiral notebook, so I'm just going to use that. No, you're not. You're not going to use that. You're going to get a binder. Okay? Um, I wouldn't be telling you this unless if it were not important. Staying organized is the most important thing in this course, and if you have a spiral notebook, that means you have to have some something somewhere separate to put your, your printouts. You need to have everything in the same place, period. Do not use uh, these folders for the same reason that I told you not to use the sleeve and the binder. That the paper is just going to fall out, or you're going to have to thumb through it. You know, to, and and it's just going to be difficult to use. You need to keep all your paper papers in the correct order. Also, do not buy these three hole punch, punches you see here, because these you see how the the plastic is clear plastic. These break too easily, so don't buy those. Get the the three hole punch that that uh, has this. Uh, whatever type of plastic that is. So that's how to stay organized using a three ring binder. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about a digital notebook if you want to go that route. 
Um, the software that I use is OneNote. I recommend OneNote. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know customer service with OneNote if anything does go wrong, and it seems to work really well. Um, you can, for as far as hardware goes, you can get a there's there's a there's a large market for these things called two-in-one laptops. Now I didn't know about this until uh, until recently, but uh, these two-in-one laptops are becoming very very popular, and there's a there's a huge number of them, and they work really well. And basically, what they are is they're a tablet and a laptop at the same time, and that's what I'm using right now as we speak. I have a Yoga 720 uh, Lenovo laptop with a, a quad-core processor and 512 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, uh, actually, 512 gigabytes of solid-state memory and 16 gigabytes of RAM, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's not perfect there, but but that's just what I'm using. And when you get and so uh, the, these are really reliable, so don't be afraid to get a two-in-one laptop. Just be sure that when you buy one, it's compatible with Windows Ink. That means that both the hardware and the software are designed to be used with a digital pen. And the bamboo pen is the pen that's most often used with these two-in-one laptops. So that's one route as far as hardware goes. But I just want you to be aware that an Apple, an, an iPad Pro is is also sufficient. That does the same thing. And I actually uh, would probably prefer to buy an Apple, an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil because they're much easier to, to, uh, to use on the go. They're lighter and they're just, uh, they're faster and they're just better products in my opinion. And they do pretty much everything that you would need. You can get a, a keyboard to put to uh, like, like a Bluetooth keyboard to use, and you can use Microsoft Office products on an iPad Pro. A lot of people may not be aware of that, but the, but Apple is now allowing uh, Microsoft products on your iPad, so you can pretty much do anything on an iPad these days. Um, not everything, but you can do quite a bit. And so I iPad Pros are another option. I actually have both of these. So uh, you know you can you can get more than one, and having having both of these allows me to keep a copy of my work in the cloud. But as I mentioned, you can also keep a copy on your two-in-one and and your iPad. But if you have an if you have a phone, you can keep a copy there too. Uh, on my iPhone, I have uh, I have Office products. I have uh, 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 Microsoft Office on my phone. So these are all uh, wonderful things to to stay organized. But again, yeah, be aware that you'll have to buy something. You'll have to buy the Apple Pencil instead of the Bamboo Pencil because Apple only uses their own pencil. So that's how to stay organized. Um, be sure that you you choose one of these. If you're going to choose the the, uh, the the paper route, use that. Use do everything that I told you to do. And uh, so anyway, that now let's go to the uh, pre-algebra course content. So if you trust that I know what I'm doing when it comes to the content, you don't have to listen to this. If you're the student, you know, you don't have to listen to this. But if you're a parent or if you're a concerned student about the content of this course, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, content because this is something that is extremely important for people who want to, you know, be sure that they're getting a quality course. This course is going to cover math in grades 6 through 8, i.e. middle school mathematics. But the first question you're going to ask is how does this curriculum compared to the curricula taught in uh, traditional middle schools. And this is going to take some explaining because there, there's there's uh, pretty big differences between my curriculum and the curricula you're going to find in uh, traditional middle schools. So let me tell you what the situation is when it comes to middle school mathematics. In the last 10 years, the last 15 years, what's been happening is the middle school math teachers have taken random concepts covered in high school mathematics and they've and, and this is uh, these are some examples so they've taken random uh, advanced concepts from high school mathematics and they've dumped these concepts into uh, pre-algebra middle school mathematics and I think the reason that they did this is that there's a lot of qualified people engineers scientists mathematicians who were telling the middle school math teachers that they need to cover more advanced mathematics to prepare students for high school and college. The problem with that is what those uh, qualified people meant was that middle school math teachers need to teach more fluency in algebra. When they were talking about more advanced concepts, that's what they meant. And I guess they just assumed that the middle school math teachers understood what they meant. 
unfortunately, the 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 uh, middle school math teachers just uh, misinterpreted what the, what they meant, or they didn't really understand that they were referring to algebra. So they just looked. They just said, "Okay, let's in order to please these people, we're just going to take a bunch of random concepts in in high school mathematics, and we're going to dump it into pre-algebra." It's unfortunate that that this, that this has happened because the uh, middle school math curriculum is has now been described as a mile wide and an inch deep, and what that means is. The middle school uh, math curriculum uh, is too big. It covers all kinds of information that uh, you really don't need to cover in, an, in a pre-algebra course simply because the, all this information is going to be covered in upper math. And it, it, uh, the, the primary reason that I'm not going to teach this information is that it's just confusing. It, it's confusing to combine algebra with all these random concepts. For example, you know, in middle school, students will learn algebra one day, and then the next day they'll learn inductive reasoning. And then they'll learn statistics the next day, and then they'll learn scientific notation. Uh, you know, uh, these these uh, concepts should be taught in separate courses. They're not really uh, pre-algebra concepts. And so, uh, you know, when you're going from probability to um, you know Pythagorean theorem to a growth and decay, you're just confusing students. And the worst thing about the the uh, mile wide inch deep uh, middle school curriculum is that it just takes away the focus from what's important in a pre-algebra course. The most important thing, as I mentioned, is fluency in algebra. The more concepts that you throw into a pre-algebra course, the more it's going to take away the emphasis from the algebra. And that's the problem, is students are not learning mastery in algebra. So uh, they're, they're, they're not, they're not uh, mastering the concepts. They're not learning enough fluency in algebra. So that's that's the problem, uh, and that that's the reason I'm not going to uh, follow the the uh, the middle schools uh, the lead when it comes to uh, designing the the uh, the curriculum. So I'm going to cover less material, but the most important thing to understand is that I'm going to cover all this material in my school. Please understand that it's not that I'm not going to cover this material. I'm not saying this material is not important. I'm just saying I'm going to uh, present the material in a different uh, order. I'm going to present this in the traditional uh, uh, high school uh, curriculum. I'm not going to dump it into pre-algebra. Um, an important thing to understand is that uh, one of the reasons that algebra is so important is that it takes a long time to learn algebra. You know, it takes it takes months or years to learn fluency in algebra. Whereas when it comes to this information, if as long as you have a good foundation in algebra, this information you can learn in maybe a couple weeks, maybe a month at the most. Um, so it's it's just not something that you should worry. This information is not stuff you should worry about. But when it comes to fluency in algebra, you need to worry about that. You need to make sure that your student is fluent in algebra because this has the potential to really slow your 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 student down. Or if you're a student listening to this, it's going to really slow you down. That's one of the reasons it's just not that important to dump all, all that all this information into uh, a pre-algebra course. Um, another reason that, that, that uh, you want to focus on the pre-algebra is that, uh, and this is something that, that uh, the middle school math teachers and most K-12 math teachers don't understand, it, when, when you take advanced mathematics, uh, specifically calculus, you're not going to get through the first week unless you're fluent in algebra. This is an example of an algebra uh, uh, a calculus problem that you need to do in the first couple weeks of your first calculus course. This is all algebra. Um, most K-12 uh, math teachers do not have STEM degrees, and uh, if you don't know what STEM means, that's S-T-E-M, Science, Te uh, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And I know it's kind of hard to believe that most of them don't have STEM degrees, but that's really, that's a fact. It's true that uh, the vast majority of them, if you lined up 100 K-12 math teachers, I'd be surprised if 10 of them had STEM degrees. Most of the people that control the, the, the K-12 system, the K-12 math system, they really don't have um, math or science degrees. And so they don't realize that this is the type of stuff you have to deal with when you go into calculus, and they don't realize that uh, algebra is the, is the most important uh, thing to, to master in, in K-12 mathematics. So... Uh, but but that's that's another reason that you want to you want to focus on algebra. And now if you're a STEM major, if you have a STEM degree, 
when you heard me say that we need to focus on uh, algebra in middle school mathematics, you probably could just stop the video right there and say, I understand exactly what he's talking about. You know, I don't need to listen. He, he's, he's right about that. But if you, if you don't have a college degree or if you don't have a STEM degree, it, you might need some more convincing. Now, I can't, I can't go through the entire calculus curriculum, obviously, but hopefully this just gives you an idea of the amount of math, the amount of algebra that you need. That, that gives you an indication of how important it is. But for those people that are still wondering, because uh, you know, a lot of people would say, well, why don't you just cover the same thing they're doing in the schools? Just go along with the crowd and do that. You know, j just do what they're doing. A lot of people just want to follow the crowd no matter what. But again, the primary reason I'm not going to cover this information in this course is it's just confusing for students. But let me give you some additional information just to uh, kind of ease your mind. Because an important point that you need, you need to understand is that in the United States, we don't teach math very well. Um, you know, we're, we're one of the lowest performing countries when it comes to math education. So if you want to give your child the highest quality pre-algebra curriculum that you can, you shouldn't be doing what they're doing in the United States. Um, you should be doing what the top performing countries are doing. And, uh, you know, again, I need to stress, I need to say over and over again, the top performing countries, they're covering the same material that we're covering in the United States. It's not different material. They're covering the exact same material. They're just covering it in, uh, in a way that focuses on, on the most important concepts first. So uh, it's just in, in how they order the material. So uh, if you use a curriculum from, from Singapore or Hong Kong or some of the top performing countries, then it's going to be what's best for your kid. Also, uh, it's, it's not just other countries that, that, uh, that take this approach. It's also... Uh, community colleges in the United States. The community colleges take the same approach. There's also um, an organization called the National Mathematics Advisory Panel, if I got that right, that was uh, commissioned by the Secretary of Education, and they they recommend that you that uh, uh, they take the approach that I'm going going to take the the approach that focuses on algebra. Uh, so, you know, and, and understand that this is pre-algebra. The name suggests that it's supposed to be preparing students for algebra. This shouldn't be something that's surprising to you. Two-thirds of the required high school mathematics is algebra. You know, ninth grade algebra, you, you take a course called beginning algebra for an entire year. That's the course after this one. Then you take intermediate algebra for an entire year. Those are algebra courses. So, that you know, just look at the title of the courses. That tells you right there what you're supposed to be learning. But again, most people who teach K-12 mathematics are not STEM majors. They're not STEM. They don't have STEM degrees. So they, that's that's the problem. It's just a problem of, of qualifications. And I want to tell you that if you if you are a, a K-12 math teacher, or if you're a parent, or or anybody that wants to teach K-12 mathematics, you can teach K-12 mathematics without having a STEM degree. But you need to understand that when it comes to designing the curriculum. When it comes to figuring out what students should be learning, you need to leave that to people who are more qualified than you. And the people out there that are more qualified are the people that have STEM degrees. They've taken chemistry, biology, physics. They've taken calculus, trigonometry, pre-calculus. Those people need to design the curriculum. And you need to follow their lead rather than just saying, we're going to do it however we want to do it and forget you people. Well, the problem with that is the United States is not performing well when it comes to mathematics, and that's one of the primary reasons is because they don't, uh, you know, the, the, the people that have, that have STEM degrees are not controlling the math curriculum, whereas in the top performing countries, the people that teach math have, uh, uh, most of them are, have STEM degrees. And that's the, the other point, the point that I want to get across is that when you look at the community colleges in the United States who are also following the, the, my approach to focus on algebra, most of the professors at community colleges, again, they have they have STEM degrees. So, in case you're wondering why there's such a difference, why why is it that community colleges and top performing countries and the math, National Mathematics Advisory Panel, why are they all saying to do it the way that I'm going to do it? Why are they doing it differently than the middle schools? It's because they have STEM degrees. Number one, it's that they have STEM degrees, but number two, they're also more accountable, you know, for for their advice or for their for their courses. Whereas the K-12 system is the most unaccountable uh, system in, in, you know, in the entire uh, education system. You know, they really don't follow anybody. They, they, they just, they don't have to uh, take responsibility 
for uh, uh, you know their 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 shortcomings when it comes to uh, mastering the the math material or making sure that students are mastering it. So anyway, uh, I'm going to uh, just give you a little bit more uh, support. Again, so uh, if you want to follow the crowd, just follow the crowd. But again, you need to use common sense. You need to uh, listen to people who are more qualified to design the, the curriculum. And if you want to give your child the, the highest quality pre-algebra course in the world, you know, you can't just follow the crowd and do what they're doing in middle schools because it's not it's not working. Your student needs to to to, to gain uh, fluency in uh, algebra. So just to give you a little bit more, uh, just to, to, to make to make sure that you're confident that I know what I'm talking about, I'm going to look at the final report of the National Mathematics Advisory Panel. This was a report commissioned by the Secretary, Secretary of Education, which is the, uh, the highest position in the, in the school system. That's the person that apparently controls the, the, uh, the public schools. They don't really control it, but they're in charge of it. And every once in a while, they, they hire a group of people to report on on the the quality of the math education that kids are getting so i'm going to scroll down to page 20 and i'm just going to read you a quote um to kind of support everything that i've been saying it's just to show you that i'm not coming up with this stuff out of the clear blue um this stuff is that there's a lot of people out there that know this again if you have a stem degree you know i don't i don't need to, to sit here and lecture you about this stuff you know that students need to focus on algebra that's the important thing but if you're if you're a parent or a student that, that doesn't have much background in uh, science or math, again, I'm j I just want to read you this quote to give you more a little more evidence to put, set your mind at ease. And again, we're not arguing about what material should be taught in the entire math curriculum in, in the K-12s and uh, in, 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 in the whole uh, the curriculum itself. We're just arguing about what when when certain concepts should be presented. So let me read this quote. It, it says, there seem to be two major differences between the curricula in top performing countries and those in the U.S. The first difference is in the number of mathematical concepts or topic, topics presented at each grade level, and the second difference is in the expectations for learning. U.S. curricula typically include many topics at each grade level, with each receiving relatively limited development, while top performing countries present fewer topics at each grade level but in greater depth. So I want to make it clear that they're not saying that uh, top performing countries cover less material overall. They're just saying that they cover less material at each grade level and they require mastery. Whereas in the United States, it's the uh, if the curriculum is described as mile wide and an inch deep, meaning they cover too much material at each grade level and they don't cover in enough depth. And continuing with the quote, it says, In addition, U.S. curricula generally review and extend at successive grade levels many, if not most, topics already presented at earlier grade levels, while the top performing countries are more likely to expect closure after exposure, development, and refinement of a particular topic. These critical differences distinguish a spiral curriculum common in many subjects in U.S. curricula from one built on developing proficiency in a curriculum in a curriculum that expects proficiency in the topics that are presented before more complex or difficult topics are introduced. So I'm not the only one that understands this. So, you know, if you're if you're going to look at my curriculum and you're going to try to discredit me, or you're going to say, well, you've got holes in your curriculum because you're not doing it exactly the way that they're doing it in middle schools. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to use your curriculum because you're, you know, you don't know what you're doing. Hopefully I've kind of given you an idea uh, of that, that I really... I, I'm a STEM major. In case you're wondering, I, I'm a STEM I, I'm a STEM major. So I I took all all four calculus courses. I took trigonometry. I took uh, uh, the uh, the science courses uh, designed for science majors uh, and engineering majors, uh, chemistry, biology, physics. That's why I'm I'm covering it. I'm I'm taking this approach is because I know this this is the better approach. It's not because I'm some I'm reckless and I'm just taking uh you know taking information out of the curriculum because I don't want to teach it it has nothing to do with that it has to do with the fact that uh I'm focusing on the on the, on the purpose of this course which is to prepare students for algebra so um all that said hopefully I've given you enough evidence to kind of uh, dir uh direct you as far as what you should be focusing on if you want to look at the uh Massachusetts standards you know there are, really are no standards nationally you have to look at the uh 
the state standards and uh, California California's where I the, the, the state that I live in and the, you know it's one of the lowest performing states in in uh, in the country whereas Massachusetts apparently is one of the highest performing so if you want to look at the standards for Massachusetts uh, they're going to include all of this information but again I'm not going to cover that information in, in my course so hopefully I've given you an idea of, of what uh, you know why how I'm developing my course. All, all of this stuff uh, focuses on uh, algebra. And that is the purpose of this course. It's to prepare you for algebra. And all this other stuff I'm going to cover in my, uh, my, later, my later courses. So that said, that's the introduction to this, uh, this uh, course. Your homework for this course, or for, excuse me, for this class, is going to be to, uh, if you're going to take the three-ring binder route, uh, buy all that equipment, and if you're going to take the digital notebook route, buy all that equipment and get that done and be ready for, your, for the next class. So I'll look forward to seeing you in the next class.